now, a First Coast News special presentation. St. Augustine, 450. Brought to you by Fields Cadillac of Jacksonville and St. Augustine and Jaguar Land Rover Jacksonville. Ring Power, North and Central Florida's Caterpillar dealer. And by American Legacy Firearms. Continue your legacy. It was a risky journey, a vast sea, a fleet of ships, and a goal not yet accomplished. We really have to appreciate this collision between old world and, and new world. The year was 1565. This truly was a military outpost. There was a lot of struggles, a lot of sacrifices. The colony, St. Augustine, it's the place where the first city in the U.S. started 450 years ago. The people of St. Augustine endured, survived, and even thrived. And still here they are, celebrating their 450th birthday. Today, a look back and forward as we commemorate 450 years. Hello, I'm Jessica Clark. St. Augustine commemorates its 450th anniversary. And it's important to remember what happened in those 450 years because what happened here changed history. And it's the people who make up the story. So let's start with those who lived here first. The Native Americans, the Tamuqua. The Tamuquan Indians walked in Florida long before Europeans claimed it for their kings. They were a sophisticated people. But this sophisticated group vanished. So what we know of the Tamuqua now only comes from European documents and from archaeological finds, much of which is stored in museums and collection buildings at the University of Florida. This is what the collection from the Fountain of Youth looks like. The Tamuqua lived in circular homes made of thatch and in organized communities where it was not unusual for the chief to be a woman. And on top of that... The Tamuqua were a matrilineal society, meaning that descent was traced through one's mother. Viva San Agustin! Viva! When Pedro Menendez arrived in 1565 and founded St. Augustine, the Tamuqua greeted him and his 800 travelers. You know, that was one of those interesting moments and world history that we really have to appreciate this collision between old world and, and new world. The Tamuquan chief gave his village and his own house to the Spanish to kindle a relationship. And the Spanish and Tamuqua lived alongside each other for months at what is now the Fountain of Youth Park. For the Americas proper, it was the first time that a European population merged with a Native American population and lived together for that long. But after about six months or so, the hostilities grew between the two groups. Eventually, the Tamuqua population plummeted. Populations uh, crashed. When the Spanish arrived, there were possibly 200,000 Tamuqua. Just 200 years later, there were fewer than 100. Historians say epidemic disease introduced by the Europeans was the biggest threat to the Tamuqua survival. It was that quiet pestilence. So what ended up happening to them 200 years after Menendez landed? When Spain ceded Florida to Great Britain, the Spanish packed up and left. The Spanish took the less than 100 Tamuqua and other natives to Cuba. If there are any Tamuqua left in the world today, it is likely that they live in Cuba. Now, 450 years after Menendez met the Tamuqua, research is underway in Cuba to know if any Tamuqua descendants remain. And the Fountain of Youth Park is rebuilding that first vital Tamuqua and Spanish settlement. It's part of an effort to remember the people who used to walk this land for thousands of years, but who no longer do. Some researchers say a small group of Tamuqua may have assimilated into other groups in Florida. And there are some self-proclaimed Tamuqua tribes in the U.S., but archaeologists tell us that based on what we know now, there are no known Tamuqua in Florida. So when the Spanish came to what we now know as St. Augustine, they came by ship, of course, and it was not an easy voyage. First Coast News wanted to see what it would look like for those ships to be packed full of men, women, and children, so we carried out an experiment. 
As the sun set over St. Augustine one night this spring. This is real living history. Volunteers gathered to recreate a moment from 450 years ago. It's probably about as authentic as it gets. Why'd you come out tonight? Um, just to be a part of history. Michael DiLorenzo. Um, I brought my uh, daughter Isabella. And his family and friends are just some of the 140 people who volunteered to board this vessel, El Galeone, docked in St. Augustine. Beautiful ship. It's the ship most similar to the one Pedro Menendez sailed when he founded St. Augustine in 1565. His ship was named the San Palayo. Very close quarters. The ship was packed to the gills. There's no exact record of how many people sailed on the San Palayo from Spain, but there is an estimate. Between 400 and 450 to be safe. Because of safety concerns, we could not put 400 people onto the ship in the marina. This is the plan. But we could put 100 people aboard. We will start then to position you into place. I just encourage you to remember that we are doing this to demonstrate how crowded it was on the San Palayo. There was absolutely no sense of personal space. <laughs> Everyone had personal space about the size of a footlocker. We're ready to have fun. So let's do Project San Palayo. One by one, the volunteers boarded. All in the black room. Taking steps Sir. back in time. Sir. It's a little bit of a historic uh, moment during our 450th. A great adventure for the oldest city. Once on the ship. Um, we are positioned up here. 16th century reenactors mixed with 21st century people representing what St. Augustine truly is 450 years after this voyage. A blend of the past and the present. How is everybody up high? Are you able to still breathe? Are you so close together? On the main deck, we squeeze the people into half of the space. We need to squeeze in, squeeze in. And then move them to the other half. And then down below on the gun deck, where it's much smaller and darker, we did the same thing. We need to move everybody in. We moved all the people into one half. I know it's tight. And then everyone moved to the other half. As close as you might be to that person standing next to you, think about eating, sleeping, trying to find a way to go to the bathroom. For about two months, men, women, and children sailed in hot, smelly, scary conditions. Below the gun deck is the holes where the livestock would be, so that created a lot more heat, a lot more smell. So not all of the people that left Spain made it to St. Augustine. Not knowing very well where you're going, not knowing if your vessel is going to hold, they all thought they were going to die. Everyone on the ship was praying for mercy. Okay, cut! That's a wrap! Once the footage was back at the station, our editing guru worked his magic. This is your shot with the background folks. And then when you composite in the foreground people, now you have the whole ship. You got a ship full of folks. A ship that now looks like 200 people on the upper decks and 200 people on the gun deck. For the folks in the project, it shifted their view of history. Oh, absolutely. It was crowded in there. I had no idea how crowded it was on these ships. I cannot imagine what they went through for months. The close quarters and the new images help us understand a little bit better what the first people of St. Augustine went through 450 years ago. Coming up, religion's reach. Christianity became firmly planted in what is now the United States. The feet on the ground approach to spreading the Catholic faith in the far reaches of Florida. The Spanish had different reasons for settling Florida. Power, wealth, certainly religion played a role. There were attempts to establish the Catholic faith in Florida before 1565, but St. Augustine is really the place where Catholicism took root in the U.S., and it was not easy. Some have called the mission of priests a journey of faith. 450 years ago, September 8th, Christianity became firmly planted in what is now the United States. Pedro Menendez founded St. Augustine with hundreds of people and four priests. Remember, there had been several expeditions before Menendez to Florida, uh, but they failed for one reason or another. Part of Menendez's deal with the Spanish monarchy was to claim land for Spain and set up the Catholic Church to bring the Catholic Christian faith to the Native Americans. And that was no small feat. Eventually, hundreds of Franciscan priests arrived in St. Augustine and fanned out into the wilderness to start mission sites, often unaware of what or who they would encounter. 
what happens is they get here and then they start to be brought out to little villages, often accompanied by uh, soldiers. But sometimes priests say they were alone as they walked to the next mission or to start a mission. That's part of the reason why this story is so marvelous. The priests set up schools and taught and preached to the Native Americans in Florida along a trail that extended as far west as Pensacola and as far north as the Carolinas. But the Spanish were not here for solely missionary purposes. This truly was a military outpost and there was a lot of struggles, a lot of sacrifices. It was very messy. When the British took over Florida for a mere 20 years in 1763, Catholicism declined. But the Spanish eventually returned to Florida and Catholicism grew, but historians say not with the same fervor that it had in Florida's first 200 years. And while the Catholic population has changed over the centuries, the face of the Catholic Church in the U.S. is now growing more and more certainly Hispanic. A recent study by Boston College showed Hispanics account for 71 percent of the growth of the Catholic population in the U.S. since 1960. Still, the Catholic Church and other churches are seeing a decline in members. Our American culture has become heavily secularized. And so, he says, the Catholic Church in the U.S. is finding itself in a similar position it did when Menendez landed. If you then make those parallels to what happened in 1565, to what's happening in 2015, it's the same message that we're trying to give, to share, to help people know the joyous nature of what our faith is about. And so the Catholic Church remains on a mission in the U.S., one that started in Northeast Florida 450 years ago. Next, putting their lives on the line. This is all part of seeking freedom. The sacrifices made by runaway slaves to establish a new home in St. Augustine. One of the lesser known stories about St. Augustine is that it was a place of refuge for slaves escaping the plantations. Slaves found freedom in St. Augustine if they could make it here. On the outskirts of St. Augustine, there was a place, a community, where slaves found freedom. It's just the beginning. In the 1700s, they were slaves that came from Charleston, Georgia. Slaves escaped on the Underground Railroad, which originally ran south, not north. They heard about Florida. The Spanish in St. Augustine gave freedom to runaway slaves, and they could live in a community called Fort Mose. Fort Mose is the first free black settlement in North America. But they had to do two things. The men had to join the Spanish military, and everyone had to become Catholic. I mean, being Catholic, defending the city was a small price to pay for your free. And there were battles. The freed slaves were valuable additions to the Spanish military, and they fought right alongside the Spanish soldiers, often against the British, which both the Spanish and slaves disliked. See, Fort Mose was strategically placed. It's about two miles north of the fort, the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. And so it was the northern defense for the city. And that meant that anyone trying to invade St. Augustine from the north by land, like those Brits up in the English colonies, had to encounter Fort Mose first. But Fort Mose was not just a military post. Life was happening there. It was a free community. Women and children also. Children were here because families were here. More than 100 people are reported to have lived at Fort Mose. Mm -hmm. Homes were inside the fort's earthen walls and crops were grown outside the fort. Working on the farm, making gardens and growing vegetables. When Florida became British in 1763, Fort Mose, a home to freed slaves, came to an end. And the people of Fort Mose ended up moving to Cuba with the Spanish. But St. Augustine continued to play a significant role in the fight for freedom, even into the 20th century. In the 1960s, during the Civil Rights Movement, marches in and images of St. Augustine prompted the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is all part of this, the seeking freedom. Thomas Jackson was a child in the 60s. He remembers watching his friends march in St. Augustine. We were freedom seekers in the uh, early 
Spanish period, and we are freedom seekers in the American period. So throughout that period, we as African and African Americans have been seeking freedom in some form or another. Today, the site of Fort Mose is a state park, and men like Jackson and Charles Ellis lead the Fort Mose Historical Society and carry out reenactments. But where is the fort? And that's one of the things we're working on. The land it sat upon is now a small island on Robinson Creek battling erosion. A fundraising effort is underway to build a replica of the fort. Once we get the bastion wall out here, I think it will help tell the story. Until then, he and people like Jackson and others will don the clothes and fire, fire the guns in order to share history. I do it because I have the passion to want to tell the story. There's nothing new about trying to, to, to seek freedom. Because some of the earliest African Americans sought, found, and defended their freedom at a little known place called Fort Mose, and as a result, protected St. Augustine. It is the oldest city, <laughs> the birthplace of freedom for African Americans. What a history. Coming up, digging deeper into St. Augustine's past. Well, I think there's reverence here. How one man's loss so long ago has become an archeological treasure. So much of what we know about St. Augustine's history is right under our feet. Archaeological digs take place every week in this town. Earlier this summer, there was a find at a dig that surprised us. That's five right there. At an archaeological dig. It's about 170. Tucked into a construction site of a new restaurant in downtown St. Augustine. City archaeologist Carl Halbert has uncovered a big find. During the first day of our excavation, we ran across a bone. Let's see. And we knew we had something, but we didn't know exactly what it was. It turned out to be this. Here we have actually the remains of a completely articulated small horse. A horse that's 200 years old. Halbert and his team, even the contractor, were thrilled. That's unusual to see that. I am just so ecstatic. Oh that's my gracious God. This is the only horse burial that we ever uncovered here in the Colonial Downtown District. The city block used to be a place for horses 200 years ago. The Spanish Dragoon barracks were here, and a Dragoon is... So basically just a man on a horse with a gun, pretty much, but they're very versatile. Essentially, this horse was most likely part of the colonial Spanish cavalry in St. Augustine. It was probably the horse of an officer. Amanda Laporta is a cavalry expert and believes, based on the skeleton's small size, it was a horse called a marsh tacky. Uh, there's this subgroup of small, hardy swamp, basically swamp ponies, that um, are descendants of the original horses brought over from Spain. And this is what a marsh tacky looks like. There are not many left in Florida. They're small, but strong. They're usually smaller than 15 hands, which equals five feet at the shoulders or withers. And horse experts say that marsh tackies like this one here were good for the Florida cavalry because they didn't eat very much. They were fast and they could maneuver the Florida terrain. When we think of Spanish horses, we think of these grand war horses, these, these Baroque horses, but uh, this horse is small and petite, which uh, it confirms the research I've been doing. In St. Augustine in the late 1700s, the cavalry did not do a lot of fighting. In general though, cavalrymen, they were messengers, they were spies, and they were guides. And the horse must have been special to someone. Well, I think there's reverence here. They actually laid it out on its side you know, with the legs kind of folded in the chest area. And this is a sign of reverence. It was a cavalryman's life. The horse was their best friend. It was all important to them. Usually, Halbert says, every artifact has a story. In this case, every feature has a story. This is one more page in the chapter of St. Augustine's history. A history carried on the backs of horses, like this one. And that's digging into history. Just like that, yep. St. Augustine 450 has been brought to you by Fields Cadillac of Jacksonville and St. Augustine and Jaguar Land Rover Jacksonville. Ring Power, North and Central Florida's Caterpillar dealer. And by American Legacy Firearms. Continue your legacy.
Uh, certainly there are other places that were established in the United States before St. Augustine, but St. Augustine is the nation's oldest city. And here's why. It is the oldest continuously European occupied city in the continental United States. Basically, that means there have been people, all kinds of people living here for 450 years. I'm Jessica Clark. Thanks for watching. People are what makes St. Augustine the place that it is. From its earliest inhabitants to its colonists, to those who found freedom here, and all who suffered brutal attacks on the city. For 450 years, through hardship and success, St. Augustine has been a living city, a place with a spirit that continues to endure.